right, hi folks. Um, I hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. My name is Eli Westerfeld, and I am the Exhibit and Registration Manager here at AAID, and I want to welcome you all to this week's Case of the Week. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Trakash Amadi. Dr. Amadi um, is a specialized implant prosthodontic surgeon practicing in Dallas-Fort Worth. He received his specialty certificate in prosthodontics and a Master of Science in Dentistry from Nova Southeastern University College of Dental Medicine. We are honored that he is with us today and to give us insight on today's case of the week. Dr. Amadi, welcome. Thank you, Eli, for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Um, um, hello, everybody, and I'd like to thank you, AAID, for giving me this opportunity to have the case of the week presentation. Uh, let me share my screen now, and then we're going to start. All right. So um, a little bit of myself. Um, uh, I graduated uh, as a dental, uh, as a um, general dentist uh, at Tehran, Azad University of Dentistry in 2009. Then I practiced a couple of years in Iran and then I moved to the US. And um, then I did my residency program in prosthodontics at Nova Southeastern University, region of great faculty like Dr. Max Nahan, Tom Bolshi, uh, Jack Piermetti, and I learned a lot from them. So right now, after I finished my uh, residency program, I moved to Dallas, Texas, and right now I'm practicing at Fast New Smile uh, Dental Implant Center. So as you can see, a little bit of the group that I'm working with, Dr. Riyad al uh in the middle, and you see Dr. Azuz, on the right side, uh, all of us are surgical prosthodontists, and uh, we have a great team and we're working together pretty good. So with that said, I'm gonna start my presentation about case of the week. Let's see what could be the learning purpose of this presentation. So uh, the first thing of uh, the purpose or the objective of this presentation is how to manage patient's expectation. Yvonne has a statement and he said, meet the mind of a patient before meeting the mouth of the patient. So that tells us it's very important to spend some time with your patient, listen to your patient and see what he or she is looking for. Is he only looking for the appearance or uh, he wants to have a function as well? Understanding the mental attitude of the patient is very helpful or the clinician to anticipate the patient's response during the clinical procedures. The other thing is the different treatment options for dental implant patients. So especially when you do a full arch or full mouth uh, kind of implant treatment, you don't have only one option. Sometimes you need to go for FPD type of prosthesis, and sometimes you need all on X, it could be all on four, all on five, or any other option. And the patient need to know the pros and cons of every single treatment. And after this discussion, uh, we can pick the correct treatment for the patient. The other thing which is important is how we should evaluate an implant patient for function and aesthetic result. We need uh, always to take a look in our patient and see uh, how he looks, like analyzing extraoral, intraoral, completely see if the patient is gummy a smile, how much teeth the patient shows. Is the face is symmetry or asymmetry? So these are all important fact factors that can affect our treatment. And also I'm gonna talk about the immediate implant press placement or uh, fresh socket implant placement and uh, grafting, which is uh, another important factor. I'm gonna talk about a couple of the studies which went through. So let's meet our patient. So my patient is a 77 year old Caucasian female. And when she came in uh, on the initial appointment, uh, that was her chief complaint. I don't like the look of my teeth. The bridge on the upper left side became loose recently and I like to chew gum. 
So that tells me that this patient, when she said, I like to chew gum, that tells me that, okay, if I can, I should avoid something cement retained in her mouth. On the other hand, uh, it seems like both appearance, aesthetic part, and also the function is very important for this patient. And later on, when I talk a little bit more to the patient, she showed me this. So this actually makes it more difficult for me uh, to treat this patient. This is all the treatment that this patient got during the last 30 years. As you can see, there are a lot of uh, provisional uh, full arch on implant for the maxillary FPD and other uh, FPD and PFM uh, restorations that she had it with herself and she showed me. And I said, okay, this is gonna be a little bit of red flag and I should be very careful how I treat this patient. So let's take a look into oral picture. This is the frontal view of a patient's teeth. As you can see, patient is class two and uh, deep bite occlusal skin uh, and mental uh, color of some implant is showing. Well, if, you, if I wanna go briefly what she had in the mouth, the upper arch number three here is the only uh, crown on the natural tooth and the rest is uh, restoration on top of the implant. It's interesting that patient had nine implant on the uh, maxilla from five different implant systems, and it was from 1994 up to 2015, I believe, was the last implant that she took. Metal color of some implant are showing, and these are tissue level implant. Implant number 10, 11, and 12 was broken from the uh, neck of the implant. Uh, you see the over contour of the restoration, deep bite as I said, and porcelain uh, chipping and defective crown both on natural teeth as well as the implant was seen uh, everywhere. And a close-up view of the, uh, in the patient's mouth, again, this is the fracture bit on the upper left side. And on the lower arch, you see number 17 and 20, it was retained root, and the rest was uh, prosthesis, crown and bridge, PFM on the natural teeth, except number 30, which was the implant crown. Let's take a look at the lateral view, right and left. As you can see, there is not enough restorative space uh, for the uh, mandibular arch because the patient was deep white. Uh, and I was not sure if the patient was initially like that or the restoration that was given to the patient actually bring a very deep bite. So let's uh, go ahead and take a look at uh, medical and social history. Uh, patient's blood pressure uh, at initial appointment was 121 over 80, which was pretty good. Uh, pulse rate was 48. Uh, there was no known drug allergy that the patient reported. Tobacco drug use was denied by the patient patient had Sjogren's syndrome. And as you know, there are two most common symptoms of Sjogren's syndrome, and that's dry eyes and xerostomia. So this is something that I need to think about it before I go for the treatment as well. Of course, there's other uh, symptoms for the uh, Sjogren's syndrome, like joint pain, swelling, uh, stiffness, but these two are the most common ones. Patient had a double mastectomy in 2008, and the medication that she currently taking was Percocet for the pain, uh, prednisone, uh, 80 milligrams. She was using that three times a week, and eye drop and lozenges. Patient also uh, had some sort of a pain on the TMJ, and that's uh, also something that I need to be careful about it. So I put the patient on an um, ASA class two physical status based on the information that she provided. Uh, dental treatment history, patient extracted uh, the teeth on the maxilla, implant supported FPD PFM on the maxilla, and PFM restoration on teeth as well as the implant on the mandible. Let's take a look at the extra oral picture. 
On the left side, you see the patient at rest, and on the right side is when the patient is smiling. It's interesting to see when the patient is smiling, even when I ask her to do an exaggerated and big smile, she didn't show even 50% of the teeth. So my patient is a low smile line, and that's something that I need to keep in mind as well. Uh, oral cancer screening uh, was negative, floor of the mouth, hard and soft tissue, tongue, everything was within normal limit. And as I said, this is a closer view of patient's smile. And this is the panorex view. As I said, now here, and number three is the only natural tooth, number four, five, seven, as well as 30. They were all implant system, which was, I mean, as I said, patient had nine different implant system. These were uh, Nobel, then for number eight and nine patient had a stroman, and that was uh, surprisingly a tissue level a stroman for the aesthetic zone that uh, was used for this uh, patient. Number 10, 11, it was a very, very old implant system. Patient placed this implant in 1994, and that was Calcitec Omnilock. And number 12, again, that was another old system, uh, Corvent. And number 14, uh, still uh, another old system, and the name for that was Renova. I believe Renova is still in the market, and there is another company carrying that keystone, it should be if I'm not wrong. Number 17 and 20 was the retained root, and the rest, as you can see, the crown and bridges on the natural teeth. FMX of the patient, patient had two huge size mandibular tori and that superimposition show, seems like patient had the bone loss on the front is, but actually they were not uh, the bone loss. And other than that, the implant uh, on the maxilla and also the mandible, they're not too bad. They're kind of okay if I want to restore them. Periodontal finding, let's take a look at the uh, perio chart. For the maxilla probing depth on most implants, it was within normal limit. For number eight and nine, as I said, it was a tissue level implant and I could get six and four millimeters on the palatal side. And for number four and five, I would be able to get five and six millimeter probing depth. Other than that, a little bit of bleeding on number five, 12 and 14 on the vocal surface. For the mandible, which was a natural teeth, uh, patient had again probing depth within normal limit uh, and the bleeding upon probing was observed on as uh, most of the mandibular teeth. So the dental diagnosis for this patient was this patient definitely had the lowest smile line. As you can see, patient had a shifted midline and it was canted. I would say it was two millimeters shifted to the left side and the midline was definitely canted. Patient had a narrow arch form. Uh, the maxillary arch was exactly like triangular and the mandibular arch was very narrow. And the patient, uh, the amount that she would be able to open was not too much. So I had a very difficult time working on her mouth. Uh, cl uh, class two occlusal scheme with deep bite, retained roots for number 17 and 20, bilateral mandibular tori, as I said, uh, partial edentulism for the patient, defective crowns, recurrent caries uh, under teeth restorations, fractured FPD as the patient reported for the upper left side, broken implants for number 10, 11, and 12, uh, metal uh, showing through the soft tissue or even uh, already exposed uh, for tissue level implants. And periodontally, I used the new classification of uh, perio and I put the patient on a stage one and grade A localized periodontitis. Why? A staging, it's just because the patient had less than four millimeters, probing depths and clinical attachment loss was within one to two millimeters. That's why the patient went to this uh, stage. And grade A is more about the complexity of the case. If the patient is non-diabetic, no a smoker, and the percentage of bone loss to age of the patient is less than 0.25, we put the patient in grade A. And overall, patient had a thin gingival biotype with overall healthy gingival. 
So with that said, let's go for the treatment option. And um, it's obvious that the extraction of retained roots number 17 and 20 and removing the implants number 10, 11, and 12, but something needs to be done. And uh, I can wait for about 30 seconds to see if anybody has any idea uh, for the um, treatment option that we can use. And uh, then I'm gonna um, talk about the treatment option that we have and which one that I pick. Meanwhile, I can, uh, Eli gonna help me if there's any uh, QAA or any idea in QAA. And uh, again, uh, I can tell you that the patient was a deep white metal, was, uh, metal color was showing through the, uh, some implants. Uh, defective restoration, occlusal plane was not even fractured um, restoration on the upper left and um, the broken implants on the upper left side. So um, the treatment option for the patient, the first treatment option could be Let me see, I think I see something uh, here. Let's see if get rid of this part. Okay, so the first treatment option could be implant placement on number 19 and 20 after extracting number um, 17 and 20. Replace all old PFM restoration with the new one and give patient FP2 type of restoration for the maxillary arch. And I'm gonna uh, talk about a little bit about what is FP1, FP2, and what is in general this classification. The other option could be uh, extraction of all mandibular teeth and do full arch implant supported FPD. And then um, I can give the patient FP1 type of restoration. The third option is extraction of all maxillary implants and mandibular teeth and perform all on X type of procedure. It could be all on four or all on five for both upper and lower arch. And finally, I can give the patient a removable partial denture on the mandible and fix implant supported FPD on maxillary implants. Of course, I can use a combination of this treatment as well. For example, I can use a restoration, FPD restoration on the maxillary arch and do all on X procedure on the mandibular arch and uh, many other combination of these treatments. So the patient initially told me that she definitely doesn't want to have something removable. So option four is already out. And for the rest, uh, let me talk about uh, the FP1 F to FP3 classification. So Mish came with the classification for implant prosthesis and it's a very popular classification and basically it was three uh, classification or categories for fixed prosthesis and two categories for removable prosthesis. And if I want to make it simple, we have FP1. FP1 is basically restoring um, the um, implant crown with the uh, kind of the same size natural tooth, which means that all you see in patient's mouth is only white part, there is no pink, and the size of that is normal. And the difference between FP2 and FP1 is exactly the amount of white that the patient is showing. For FP2, you still will see only white, but the tooth is elongated, which means that, like for example, this patient, if you take a look at this restriction, and this is FP2 because it's elongated and the patient is showing more than normal amount of white. But for FP3, the story is totally different. Patient has pink part as well as the white part. So all, all of four type of restoration, they are in the category of FP3 because patient has both white and pink part. On the other hand, uh, he had two classification for removable prosthesis and that was RP4 and RP5. RP4, if I wanna give you a, an example, is basically completely supported by the implant. Like if you have four or five implants in patient's mouth, 
you connect the implant with the bar attachment and then you have a removable prosthesis overdenture uh, on top of the bar and that's only supported by the implant so that is rp4 and if you have some sort of overdenture that uh, only uh, supported with uh, two implants for example in interframinal area uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, use, if you're using bar attachment or locator abutment it's still the same and the prosthesis basically get the support from the soft tissue and also the implant then that type of prosthesis is rp5 so that's basically the main difference between rp4 and rp5 so let's go for the treatment plan for this patient. After uh, giving the patient all the pros and cons of the, each treatment option and I spent some time with the patient, I came up with the treatment plan and I decided first to uh, do the ideal wax up. And as a prosthodontist, our best friend is articulator and wax up. So I did the ideal wax up on the cast, both for the upper and lower arch. I had the shell uh, for the provisional ready on a day of execution. And I had the patient, uh, patient appointment and the patient was ready. So what I did initially, I removed the old prosthesis from the upper arch first and see what's going on underneath the prosthesis, as well as that uh, implant, uh, sorry, natural tooth crown. So I saw, uh, as you can see, the angulation of the implant, especially number eight and nine, seems like it's too facial, especially number eight. Number 14 seems to place a little bit uh, more, more toward buccal. And the rest, uh, except that number 10, 11, 12, which they're broken and uh, they're not useful anymore, they're, they're okay. And I told the patient, I prefer to have this treatment for you if it's possible. I still didn't promise any kind of treatment to the patient. And it's very important to tell the patient in advance because anything that you're gonna tell the patient after the fact, it's gonna be an excuse. And the patient need to know in advance if there is any chance of changing a treatment plan at any case, because this case was kind of a complicated case and I couldn't tell the patient, okay, if 100% I can do this treatment or I should do another type of treatment. So I decided to remove implant number 10, 11, and 12, extract number two, and the reason to, uh, for extraction number two was because after I removed the crown, I saw the severe decay on the facial and lingual, plus that tooth didn't have any opposing tooth. So it was kind of useless to have one single crown, which the tooth was not good, and uh, there was no opposing tooth for that. So I decided to remove that number three. It was number three, not number two. And I put the new screw retained prosthesis on implants and it was only if it's possible to do it. And the reason for that, because of the angulation of all those old implants. Now it's the time to go for the lower arch and see what I can do for the uh, mandibular arch. So initially, based on the perio examination and x-ray, my plan was to restore all the teeth because I would be able to remove all those crowns and put the new crown. But when I remove the crown, guess what I see? As you can see, two teeth already came out with the crown. That, that's number 23, uh, uh, sorry, 20, yes, 23 and 25. And also the rest were very narrow. They again had decay on the buccal and lingual surface. So I told the patient, listen, these teeth are too small, two of them, they're already gone, and the rest, they are not good. And I can't have a long-term good prognosis for these teeth. So my um, suggestion is not to keep these teeth and remove them. And the patient, she agreed with me, and she said, okay, I 100% agree with you, and I don't want to keep these. So now I have a treatment option. I can remove all these teeth and give the patient a couple of implants, either FPDPFM type of restoration on implants or give the patient like all of four type of three. And again, I talked to the patient, we have two options, this and the other one. And after we had the conversation, she decided 
to go for FPD, which I agreed with uh, her. And the reason for that was if I wanted to do um, uh, all on four type of prosthesis, I had to do the alveoloplasty. And that implant on number 30 was completely useless. I couldn't use that implant anymore because my alveoloplasty was somewhere pretty close to the apex um, of these teeth. So this implant should come out and I should place the new implant. And since that implant was okay, and patient had less uh, problem maybe with the FPD type of prosthesis, then she, uh, I, I'm going with um, uh, FPD type of restoration. So I decided to remove all mandibular teeth, fresh socket implant placement, at the same time bone graft and implant supported FPD PFN. As well as I'm gonna remove these two large size tori on both sides while I'm doing the uh, basically surgery. So this is the time uh, to execute the treatment. And the issue that I have now is how I can execute the treatment if I wanna do the FPD for this patient and I still give the patient some teeth to go home uh, with. Because if I wanna remove all these teeth and place the implant for FPD, I cannot load them on the same day. And uh, I didn't plan to place like eight or nine implants and then put the FPD because there was no need to do that. If I would be able to place four more implants, that would be more than enough plus uh, this patient didn't have a huge size, arch size, and uh, there was no reason to place many implants. So I decided to uh, stage the case. In other words, uh, just leave some hopeless teeth in the mouth and use them for the provisional phase. At the same time, remove the other teeth, place my implant, and let the implant heal meanwhile. And when they heal, then I can jump to the provisional on top of the implant. So I decided to keep number 21, 24, 28, 9, and the implant number 30. And I wanted to place my implant on this heel area number 19, 22, 25, as well as 28. So let's go for execution. So how I start the treatment, I start with the lower arch. Uh, the lower arch, I went in. As I mentioned, I removed the teeth and I placed my implant for number uh, 19, 22, and 25. I removed these tori on this side. And since I still wanted to place one more implant on number 28, I decided to do that later on because this number of teeth was not enough to hold my prosthesis because they were too narrow, too little, and the chance of breaking the provisional on top of those was high. So I placed my implant and that was a phrase socket implant placement. Uh, a little bit talk about the phrase socket implant placement. Well, there was a study that uh, was uh, for uh, Dennis Tarno, uh, Salama, and it was a multi-center uh, kind of a study. And it was a great, great study. I believe it was for 2015, if I'm not wrong. And it was saying, whenever you place your implant, should you graft it or you shouldn't graft it? First of all, your implant uh, should always be as lingual as possible um, uh, and as uh, far as possible from your buccal plate. And the reason for that is buccal plate, the, room, the more room that you have from your implant to the buccal area, you can graft that area and the amount of resorption that you may get is still gonna help you to have bulk of bone on the facial and buccal of your implant, as well as it doesn't jeopardize the position of the implant if it's gonna to be too lingual for your prosthesis. So in that study, they come up uh, with the result that whenever you do the fresh socket, and it was on the aesthetic zone, fresh socket implant placement, and how much you have a gap between your implant and your buccal plate, the best result is when you graft the area. Before that, they came up with this um, result that, okay, if you have less than three millimeters gap, you don't need to graft it. But they found that there is a difference in, in the amount of bone resorption when you graft the area, comparing not to graft the area. And that was, if I'm not wrong, like something between 0.1 to about a millimeter. 
So that was a big difference. So they came up with the idea of provisionalizing the implant and the aesthetic area and grafting the zone is the, you want to get the best result with that. So that's what I did. I placed my implant, I graft this area, and then I put my uh, basically bone graft material on that area. Again, what kind of bone graft you're going to use? Xenograft, allograft? There's a lot of argument and discussion about that. Uh, each of them has their pros and cons. My personal option for um, most of my cases, not all of them, is allograft. And the reason for that is if you really have a good buccal plate, there is no need to use xenograft. The advantage of xenograft toward uh, allograft is um, that it takes longer time for xenograft to uh, absorb on that area. And that could be at the same time a disadvantage because especially sometimes you see the uh, xenograft stay uh, in that area seven or nine years and it is still the completely doesn't absorb. Uh, but, and also the quality of the bone that you're going to get with allograft most of the time, uh, after three to four months, it's going to be something close to type two uh, type of bone. But uh, with xenograft, even after four to six months, this is actually my personal experience. Uh, the bone was not too hard. It's somewhere close to uh, type three or four uh, bone when I use the xenograft. But it's still, definitely both of them have their usage. I personally used allograft for this case, and that was DFDBA because I wanted to take the advantage of both um, osteoinduction and osteoconduction of the bone graft material. So I um, sutured the area. I had my hopeless and for my provisional phase, and then same appointment, I went to the upper arch. As I said, I removed the old prosthesis. I already had my shell. Now I'm going to give my patient a new uh, provisional on the implant for the maxilla and on the hopeless teeth that I staged the case for the mandible. So the patient left the office like this uh, with the provisional. Now, Later on, patient came back, and this is the time for me to remove those uh, basically hopeless implants, number 10, 11, and 12. So what I did, I removed all three implants. Number 10 and 12 was easy to remove. I just could use hemostat and just unscrew them counterclockwise and remove them. And for number uh, 11, 12, uh, sorry, 11, I had to terrify that area a little bit to remove it. Then again, since I had the buccal plate here, I used allograft, grafted area, and closed this up. And this is my implants. As I said, this is a core vein with those holes, those old system implants, and the other two was Omnilog Calcitech implants. So now it's a time for the second stage surgery. After 12 weeks, uh, or maybe I believe it was 15 weeks, yes, that I uh, back to the lower arch, I did the uncovering, second stage surgery for my implants. And meanwhile, I placed the implant for number 27. If you remember, I initially told uh, you guys that I want to place my uh, last implant on number 28. But when I opened this area, and I don't have a picture for that, uh, I found that, okay, I have a good bone on number 27, and this is the heel bridge. Why well, shouldn't I place the implant right here? And still, I can take the advantage of using provisional on that four teeth uh, and one implant. So I removed, as you see, the tori and placed my implant on number 27, did the second stage surgery, and give the provisional to the patient back again. And a patient left home, came back. This is the heel reach. After three weeks, I did the uncovery uh, for the patient. So now this is the time. The upper is ready, the lower is ready. However, I still need to place the implant for number 11, but I'm not sure for the uh, maxillary implants if I can give the patient something, a screw retained type of prosthesis or not. Why? Because some of the implants, especially number eight and nine was placed too facial. So I decided to give the patient a second pair of provisional, this time on implants, both, both for, maxilla and mandible, and both of them 
a screw retain. So I went in, I made my final impression on the existing implants, as you can see, uh, how facially placed the maxillary implants and the mandibular implant that I placed and the heel second and sixth surgery was done and ready for final impression. So as I said before, since the patient's mouth was too little, I had to be kind of a creative. So I used open tray uh, impression technique for all implants except for number uh, 30. Why? Because I simply couldn't get that open tray impression coping to that implant. So I had to use closed tray and take them all in one impression. So I made my impression both upper and lower. I did, uh, again, wax up on the um, implant on the articulator. Now I saw that, okay, it seems like I'm lucky. Now I'm gonna give the patient a new provisional on implant. As you see, I was lucky enough because this number eight implant is pretty close to the incisal edge, but it's still I can use it. Even though the other thing is like number 14, it's placed too facially, but that's fine. I'm not too worried about that since my implants are good and I only need to place one more implant here on number 11, then I'm gonna use those old implants. And uh, the lower implant, the position, everything is beautiful and I have no problem to give the patient a final restoration. So this is the second set of provisional for the patient and the patient left uh, home with uh, this new provision. Now, I have the patient back, and now this is the time after the upper uh, left side ridge is healed. Now it's a time to place the implant on number 11. So what I did, I placed the implant right on top of the ridge. And as you can see, I kind of rolled back the facial tissue to give this area a little bit more of keratinized tissue while it's healing, and everything was ready and then I wait, I get the patient provisional again, send the patient home, wait for uh, eight weeks and everything was ready now to make the final impression and give the patient final prosthesis. And as you can see on the next slide, this is my final prosthesis. Implant number 11 is there, everything was ready. It's a ceramometal restoration and I did two pieces uh, of PFM FPD restoration instead of one. And the reason for that was since my implants was very diverged, some of them are two facial, two buccal here, I thought if I want to do one piece, even though all of them are abutment level, but it's still there's not a hundred percent chance of getting a passive fit for the prosthesis. So, and I had enough implant on each side, three on the left side and four on the right side. So I would be able to do um, basically two section of the prosthesis. And for the lower, my final was one piece. Implant was, all implants were fairly parallel and I would be able to give the patient a final prosthesis one piece. And that's how the final prosthesis and patients is smart patient was happy with the uh, results. And this is an interesting uh, final procedure that I wanted to show it to you. As you can see, for those uh, anterior, the stromal implants, the metal color of that tissue level implants is showing through. But am I gonna be worried about? No, why? Because I already knew that it's gonna happen. I already told my patient patient was 100% aware of it. And since the patient had lowest smile line and she didn't even show 50% uh, of the teeth even on her exaggerated smile, so I would easily would be able to give patient uh, this type of prosthesis. The other thing was on the second stage uh, uh, of provisional, a provisional on implants, I opened the vertical. If you remember, initially patient didn't have enough restorative room for the mandible. So I opened the vertical on provisional phase and I wanted to try, and I opened for three millimeters, I wanted to give it a try to see if the patient can tolerate it. Uh, because patient had a history of TMJ problem, it could be for any reason, but sometimes when you open the bite, patient cannot tolerate it. And for two months, I put the patient uh, on those restoration with uh, new vertical dimension and the patient had no issue with that. 
So I was sure that, okay, I can go ahead and give the patient my final prosthesis. As you can see on the upper left side, my restoration is a little bit over contour. And again, the reason for that was for number 14, because it was placed too facially. However, I recontour this area and patient will be able to clean that area pretty good. And uh, this is the Panorex view of the final prosthesis. All my implants, they look good. No bone loss, upper and lower. And this is before and after. This is how the patient came in and how she left. As you can see patient, I didn't try to change the occlusal scheme from class two to class one. Patient is still class two, but instead of having the patient on deep bite, I just gave her more overjet and less overbite. So the patient didn't suffer uh, from that amount of overbite and basically introducing a lot of protrusive force when she's going to protrusion. And this is a panorex view before and after, uh, how the patient came in and uh, how she ended up uh, getting the treatment. And as you can see, all of the maxillary implants, I placed a multi-unit and um, tried to have them as parallel as possible. And with that said, I'm gonna finish my presentation uh, with a great statement of Persian poet, theologian, and Sufi, Rumi. Uh, he mentioned that, do not grieve. Anything you lose comes around in another way. And with that said, I wanna thank AID, American Academy of Implant Dentistry, uh, to give me this great opportunity to do this uh, webinar presentation. And I wanna thank everybody to attend this uh, presentation. If you have any questions or discussion, I would be more than happy to answer. All right, yes, thank you again, Dr. Ahmadi. Um, I don't see any questions right now. I'll leave it up for you know, another 30 seconds to a minute. I know Facebook lags a little bit sometimes, so if anybody um, has any questions, we'll just wait for them. Um, so let's just wait a minute. But yeah, no, no questions so far. Sure. Uh, thank you, and uh, you have a great evening. Awesome. Yeah, you guys have a great weekend as well. Um, and just so everybody knows, we do have another um, webinar coming next Tuesday um, at 6 p.m. Central Time as well. Um, it is a free webinar with um, Dr. Madeline Lewis. And yeah, I'll be here with you again next Tuesday. So if you have no other questions are coming in, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I just hope you all um, stay safe and have a wonderful week. Sure. Have a great day. Thank you.